Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Trev, the backup preacher. I'm one of the pastors here at Copper Hills. Uh, if we've never met, I would just love in the plaza afterwards, if I could introduce you to Pastor Brad and he'll talk to you for as long as you want about whatever you want to talk about. Actually, he's away today, so just talk amongst yourselves when you go out there after. Okay, I'm going to get right into it. We're in this terrific series right now here at Copper Hills called The Way, okay? Uh, did you know early Christians referred to themselves as The Way or people of The Way? They weren't actually called Christians, which means like little Christs, until uh, much later. So they called themselves people of The Way. What way was that? Well, it was Jesus' way. Uh, he had a way. He had a way that he lived his life. You might say a way of life. Uh, he definitely had a way with people. And most importantly, he had the way back to God. Uh, and in fact, he was the way. He literally personified the way. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so as followers of Jesus, we want to learn his way. And we want to live in that way. Right? Hence our current series, The Way. So here's where we're at. We have this big, looming question about the Christian life. Can our lives really change? Can we actually be transformed? Can we actually live like what Jesus is describing for real? Can we really live this extraordinary, eternal kind of life that Jesus claims to be offering us? Because many of us have tried real hard and often it's not gone well. I've actually, heard, I've actually heard the average amount of time spent on a diet is one day. How can that be the average? Like who in here is only able to make it two hours and then I'm out. Give me the donut. I can't. Pull it together. You're, you're pulling down the average, Dave. Come on. So willpower is weak. We're going to talk about this for a second. So here's good news. I have good news for you. Every sermon should have good news in it. Your life can change. I assure you. History has proven. Lives in this congregation have proven that Jesus can change lives. A few weeks ago, we had uh, uh, some incredible testimonies up here of guys uh, in a really bad spot, like, you know, with a, a gun in the mouth type, bad spot, bottom end of the rope, lives changed, transformed, saved out of addiction and death into fruitfulness and life and starting that rehab, that hold fast rehab up in Prescott. Amazing story uh, of transformation. Brad has done a terrific job in this series of articulating uh, the forces that are working on us that are changing our lives. Your life's getting changed uh, all the time. Because of these forces. Uh, some of these forces are intentional uh, that you put yourself into, and some forces acting on us are unintentional. Just by watching a lot of TV or commercials can shape you, right? Uh, we talked last week about the power of the Holy Spirit to transform our lives. This is incredibly important because what we are not talking about in changing your life is um, self-discipline, self-effort, or willpower. That's what, that's what lands you in the... Uh, one day diet problem, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna base it on willpower. This is something different, something transcendent. Jesus gives his life and opens up the kingdom of God to us, then leaves and sends his Holy Spirit to guide us and be with us and to counsel us, which is central to the whole thing. Um, speaking of central, Brad created this triangle, uh, the Pastor Brad Clausen triangle of transformation. Uh, with people and experiences and practices and knowledge. And then the Holy Spirit's at the center. That's what's driving this whole thing in your life. The Holy Spirit orchestrating it all. So today it falls to me to talk about the knowledge piece up at the top. Specifically how we appropriate spiritual knowledge through teaching and learning. So how we learn the way from Jesus our, as our teacher. Okay? In his famous parting comments before uh, leaving... Uh, Jesus gives us his great commission, which you know in Matthew 20, 18, but I like to put it up there. I come back to this all the time. Here's what he said. Here's what Jesus said at the end. Go 
and make disciples. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And here it is. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay. So there's two things I want to point out there. Number one, we have teaching. Number two, we have obeying. Which, let me just translate that word obey for you right now. Uh, it means to actually do the stuff he's talking about. <laughs> like he's not just teaching it, like we're actually meant to be doing the stuff he's talking about. Now, at this point, as we're talking about teaching, I have to make an important cultural observation about what's happening in this time period. Jesus was a teacher, um, but in that time period in culture, it was called a rabbi. We've been talking about that, and it was something a bit different than what you maybe think of as a teacher. Uh, back then, to become a student of this kind of teacher, a rabbi, and the students were called Talmudim, and very few of them actually made it to this level, but here's what it meant to be a student in this context of the Bible that we're talking about. It meant to actually move in with the rabbi, live every day with that rabbi, learn from that rabbi through everyday events, encounters, and experiences until you actually started to think like that rabbi and even became like that rabbi so that you would remind people of that rabbi. That's actually what we're trying to do here. That's why we talk about what are we doing at Copper Hills. We're trying to, uh, we're putting things in place to help you increasingly think like Jesus uh, so that we uh, increasingly remind people out there of him. Okay? So it is that we are Jesus' students. He's our rabbi versus students, but the, that word doesn't capture it. There's a better word for this, like an apprentice. We've been throwing this word around, an apprentice. Okay? Remember there was that show, The Apprentice. I forget who was on it, but I think he went into politics. That's <laughs> what's happening there. Um, an apprentice, whether it's a plumber, an electrician, or a doctor, or whatever, they, those kind of apprenticeship type professions, uh, is uh, the apprentice is trying to become what the master is, and then so that they naturally do what the master does. Okay, our lives transform as we apprentice ourselves to Jesus in his as his everyday living students. That's the transformation plan. That's the genius of the Holy Spirit coming because he can be with us every day. This system is based on being with the master every day. Isn't that genius how he leaves in bodily form, comes in spirit form, so he can be with us every day as our teacher. Now, it is a little bit hard to picture what we're talking about though. So I want you to think of it this way. Imagine you got offered a three-year apprenticeship, live-in apprenticeship, in something. I don't know what you're into. Maybe investing or tech or writing or music or film. But, you know, like, if you're into investing, imagine Warren Buffett calls you up and says, hey. Uh, or in technology, if it was Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, or in writing. What if J.K. Rowling or George R.R. R. Martin calls you up? And, or, or in music, Paul McCartney, Taylor Swift, or Drake sends you a letter. Or I know we got film people here today. You know, what if Steven Spielberg or J.J. Abrams calls you up and says, so, I have this plan. I'm getting um, a dozen everyday people together to come and live with me at the house, you know, and then traveling with me and going on projects uh, so that I can impart to you what I know and how I do what I do and, and sow that into you, whether it's investing or tech or writing or music or film. Can you imagine? Would you do it? I would. I mean, I don't even listen to rap music, but if Drake called me up, <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, let me just talk to my wife quickly just to see <laughs> if, what, if I'm available um, for that. So, now imagine Jesus calling you up. Hey, I'm getting a dozen ordinary people together. Uh, I'm thinking about you. I think, you know, I prayed all night about this and I, I'd love for you to be one of them. We just come. We got about three years. This is the plan. This, this invitation that he's laying out is an invitation to become like him and, and, and be what he is and do what he does. In Luke 6.40, Jesus says, students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. We are, we are students being fully trained right now. Did you know? You're in training right now and becoming like Jesus. That's huge. Think about this for a second. You know, um, everybody here probably been in school, for, of some kind of school, for something, right? Public school, high school, college, I don't know. Kindergarten. Best three years of my life, kindergarten. 
nap and snack as part of school. Like, why did they ever take that out? <laughs> Dear Lord, bring that back. Okay, let me ask you this. In any class that you ever took, would it, was it ever the point that you would take on the characteristics of the teacher and actually, actually become like him or her as a person? No. Probably not. You only see true apprenticeship in a few places in our culture, like in the trades, right? Master carpenter, apprentice carpenter, master electrician, apprentice uh, uh, electrician, or in martial arts. Like if you watch a late night like kung fu movie, you'll see, you know, the master student relationship there. And the, so like the one master, he, like if he knows tiger style or snake style, you, 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 don't, you don't go to the tiger style guy to learn snake style. You would learn the style of that master and get that style, right? That's how it works. I've actually taken martial arts here and in Japan uh, a little bit as well. And I notice here, because of our emphasis here on individualism, uh, so much. If you notice, it's like guys that get their yellow belt and they want to like have their own style. Did you have that guy at high school? He studied karate. I've got my own style. Now, I've invented crab style. You know that? I found out in Arizona, they actually, in the kung fu, they got the scorpion style. It's like crab, but the back, back foot comes <laughs> over the top. Which I can do, but I would have to stretch a lot to do the move over the top. Here's my point, okay? In Western civilization, most of our schooling amounts to giving information that you reproduce in language or symbolically on a written test. It's a problem. Dallas Willard, who wrote The Divine Conspiracy that we talk about a lot, and he was a philosophy professor at USC, famously tells this story of his student in his ethics class who got an A, his A student in his ethics class, who did something profoundly unethical in that class to one of the other students. Interesting, right, and ironic. Knew the answers to answer the exam, got all the right ethical answers, but doesn't live like that. Doesn't practice them. You don't need to practice them. You don't need to do that. You actually don't even need to believe it to pass our tests. You just have to have the right information. Okay, now, everyone's like, oh, yeah. Don't judge that guy too quick, though, because here's the thing. I would say that us, in the evangelical church, are educated far beyond our obedience. What do you think? I actually think we know more, way more than we actually do. Right? Uh, you'll hear people concerned about so-and-so is into prosperity gospel, or I think that's guys teaching salvation by works or something. Uh, you almost never hear deep concerns that uh, I don't think we're actually loving our enemies. I've actually never heard that. I've heard lots of people worried about prosperity gospel here and there. I've never heard someone say, I don't, I don't know if we're caring for the poor enough. I don't, know if we're, I don't know if we're loving our enemies. I don't know if we're actually doing that. Interesting. So what does it mean to truly know something? We're talking about knowledge here today on that triangle. What does it mean to know something? When you can reproduce it on paper in a test? Or when you've got that working in your life? And you know there's a Christian, if you've been in church, you know there's a Christian version of that. When you know the Sunday school answers to stuff, but you don't actually live like that. I love that story of the kid in Sunday school uh, where the teacher says, Okay, what's small and gray and furry and has a fluffy tail and collects up nuts for the winter? And the kid says, sounds like a squirrel, but I know the answer is Jesus. Because <laughs> that's like the answer to everything in Sunday school, right? It's because it's given the right information answer. We're, we're not trying to get Jesus as the answer. We're trying to get him into our life. We've somehow separated the knowledge of a thing from the living and the doing of a thing. It's a problem. So how did this happen? Well, let me just educate us a bit more on this. This separation of thinking and living, something goes all the way back to ancient Greece, at least in Western civilization. And ancient Greece, as you know, was very thinky, 
wonderfully thinky. Uh, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, philosophy, mathematics. You know, that time period in Athens was like the heart of Western culture. We all kind of derive from that. Uh, but the Greeks kind of separated the thinking about stuff from the thing itself. It was one of the aspects of dualism, is the technical term. They, they kind of went two ways with that. So they can, they symbolize stuff so they could think about it up here. There's this famous statue by Rodin called The Thinker that I pulled up for you guys. This, this to me is the picture of learning in Western civilization. You know, I'm thinking, it's very cognitive. It's very up in the head, okay? Uh, uh, and, and that's a Greek picture. And, and to me, that's Western civilization right there. But the picture of learning in Jesus' time was quite different. In Jesus' time, the picture of learning was not sitting and thinking, but walking along the road with the rabbi. You know, real life, experiential. Looks like this. Sorry, it's pixelated here. Look on the side ones are a little bit better. See, they're walking. You know, they're, it's in motion. Um, it, it's, it's the discussion on the way. It looks, like, it looks like Jesus, the rabbi, the master of all life. And actually, the, 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 these, this, these were all Jewish guys at the time. And so this, this, some of this mode is still going on today. I think I got another picture I found of like a couple rabbis talking. Look at all those Talmudim. Guys are learning. Like, look at them all crowding around there to kind of see what they're going to say. And, and this discussion. I imagine that didn't look like school to you. So let me ask, let me ask this question. How was school for you? Wow. Uh, did you love it? I, I was actually maybe a natural student because I was good with information, but imagine my surprise when I discovered lots of people, maybe even most people, didn't like school. And it's not the teacher's fault either. We've got these awesome, fantastic teachers. I, personally, I'm not an educator, but like it's a little bit how we've set it up in Western civilization. It's our way, actually. So um, actually, as part of my preparation for this message, I watched this TED Talk by... Sal Khan, who did the Khan Academy. You guys know what the Khan Academy is, right? Where you can like, this, this amazing story. It's this guy who, his cousins were like failing math. And so he was far away though. So he started teaching them on YouTube. And then everybody could go on YouTube. And then now everyone was learning. This thing took off and became huge uh, and was way better for some reason of teaching people math than in school. Now that's interesting. Why is that now? What's he doing? How is he doing that? Now, I invite you, to, I, you should go look at the, go look at the TED Talk, Sal Khan, K-H-A-N, and I don't want to ruin it for you, but I'm going to ruin it for you right now. <laughs> Here's how he's doing that. He teaches for mastery, not for test scores. What's that mean? Mastery. So, let me just tell you, if we were going to, do, if we were going to turn this into a big math test today, everybody just clenched up. Two-thirds of you just, <laughs> jaws tightened and Little veins popped out in your head. Acid, squirt. Um, somewhat, people here, so some of you are going to get a 70, some of you are going to get a 50, some of you are going to get a 95. I see some 95s over here. I see other things over here. Um, but here's what would happen. As long as everybody passed, we would just move on to the next unit. Here's the problem. If you got a 70, you'd have this 30% gap in your knowledge. We move on to the next unit. You get a 70 again. You got another 30% gap. Now you got gaps on gaps. You're trying to write, then you're going to go write the test, and you're now missing increasingly number of pieces. Those 30% gaps are going to stack up. So now you got gaps on gaps on gaps. All of a sudden, you don't have, you can't, don't have what you need to write that test. And you end up failing math because you don't have the piece that you need. It's, it's absurd. We don't think it's absurd, but imagine if, like, we built houses this way. Right? Okay. Build the foundation. Inspector says, 70% uh, done. Pass. Start framing. <laughs> Start framing. 65% done. Pass. Start in the second level and start the drywalling. Roof. You know what's going to happen here, right? Gaps and gaps and gaps. I actually was fighting with my home builder this week. I... Um, our house that we built here has a, like a, in the center of it's kind of like a round turret with a little roof with like six kind of spines coming out on the boards. And uh, thank goodness I got the home inspection warranty. It had some knowledgeable person get up there and look around. Guess what these guys did? The three boards on the back of that, they didn't put the boards. They just tiled over it. 
No one's going to know. You know what? I'm here to tell you that 50% is not a pass on your roof. You're going to want 100% of the joists in your roof. Uh, it's crazy. But we, for some reason, we think we can learn other stuff like this with huge gaps like math or English or discipleship or something I'm going to get to. Why do we do this? It's because of efficiency and cost. It's a manufacturing model. It's the, it's the industrial revolution that when everything became like a factory and then we're going to do education like a factory too. Made it into an assembly line, time-limited efficiency. Uh, why did those roofers, why do you think those guys, you know, what happened there? Why didn't they put the three boards on the back? And why did they kind of try and hide it and move on? You can see what happened, right? It's Friday. We got it. We're on a schedule. We didn't bring enough boards. We're not going to just... See how that pressure kind of causes problems? Only set amount of time. Time is money. Uh, and then we can take that approach in our learning in our education too. We know how to massively improve learning and education. Again, I'm not an expert. Talk to the educators here. They'll, they'll, we've got these great teachers in our congregation. They'll tell you about this. I think we mostly know how to improve education though. Customize it to the individual student and to their learning style. Lots of one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher. Student student-teacher ratios. Uh, make it real life and experiential. Uh, taking as much time as needed to achieve mastery. We kind of know what to do, but the knowing is not the problem. The doing is the problem. Why don't we do that? Time and money, manufacturing model, industrial revolution, efficiency, cost. Okay, here's my point. I had to tell you all that to tell you this. You ready? Jesus our friend, brother, and teacher is not mass producing us like what might have happened to you in school. He's growing us, not manufacturing us. He has a completely personalized learning and development plan for you. He's working on it right now. And he's actually weaving it with some other people here too. He's working that all together. Uh, that plan, that learning plan he has you on is mostly not lecture style. There's a little bit. This is the lecture part right here. Just so you know, but most of it's actually going to happen outside those doors. That school, it involves a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him personally. If you show up for the meeting, you know, the one-on-one -on -one time is huge. There's a lot of group work. That's an important part of it. Um, his classroom is real life. Everyday experiences, just like he was teaching these guys. As you encounter things, he's going to teach you about that. Um, this, because uh, uh, his goal with us is mastery. He has as much time as you need. He'll spend as much time with you as you need to learn that thing that you need to get an internal kind of life working for real. This is not, what we're doing here is not about passing a test. Getting into heaven is not passing a test and I've got the right answer. You don't get to the pearly gates and go, it sounds like a squirrel, but I know the answer is Jesus. In. In. It's not about that. This is about learning a new spirit-powered way of life that starts right now. It's Jesus' way. Like, can we start living Jesus' way for real? Well, here's the question. How can we teach and learn? I'm teaching up here right now. How can we teach and learn so that knowing something means actually incorporating it into our lives and not just transferring information? So we can actually do it and our lives are transformed as a result. Okay, let me tell you what happened to me. I've actually done a lot of school. Uh, you know, academic type school that has a lot of that information transfer stuff in it. But I had a kind of an interesting, powerful learning experience right here at Copper Hills uh, less than a year ago, like this year. I had a very interesting experience. Uh, and it really made me think, because I'm a pastor of spiritual formation, so I'm thinking about all the time, like, what actually forms people? What actually shapes them? I'm sometimes amazed at people's ability to, um, like, have near-perfect church attendance, but had that not, like, really affect their life that much. So I'm often looking for other environments. What actually changes you and shapes you, right? So here's what happened. When we moved from Canada to the U.S., uh, I actually, you know, I was on uh, Canadian Wall Street, so I moved from marketplace to ministry. And um, so my income really changed down, and, uh, which is normal and good, and this is part of the invitation. Not as low as Brad and Elfie's when they first came to uh, plant this church. In fact, I think they made them pay to come here or something. Um, <laughs> But anyway, here was an opportunity. Like, our life really changed. Like, we're in a situation now. 
Um, we had to redo our whole budget, new costs, everything was new, new air conditioning costs, and also uh, air conditioning costs, and then there was some air conditioning costs. <laughs> this was like, this is not the big cost in Canada, just so you know. Okay? So anyway, as it turns out, I'm in charge of courses here at Copper Hills, and we offer a bunch of courses, and we have this course that they offer here called Financial Peace University. Have you heard of this guy? I'm new to America, but have you heard of this guy, Dave Ramsey? He's an interesting guy. Um, at first, his accent was throwing me off, which is funny, because pot, kettle black, but... Because um, my accent's throwing you off right now. But I honestly think this guy is taking on a huge like nationwide spiritual formation project around a very spiritual issue, money and debt and behavior and habits and all this stuff, and getting some success and some traction on this. This is very interesting to me, you know, on, on, in the financial arena, which I argue is a spiritual arena. Now, here's the thing, because we're talking about knowledge today. I think people mostly already have the knowledge. Like, they already know what to do. I was driving with my buddy who was a pastor and again, he's like not making enough money and, uh, and he just lost, lost a bunch of money on a get rich thing and he was discouraged about this because he's trying to find ways for his family and stuff. And so I said to him, you know, if you want to generate wealth, there's a simpler way. And then he said, you mean spend less money than I make over a long period of time? I was like, yeah. Then there's this awkward silence. Because it already knows. The knowing is not the problem. The doing is the problem. So, like, has anyone here ever heard Dave Ramsey on the radio? Okay. Did that solve all your financial problems? Probably not. So here's where I'm going. You need more than just the knowledge. Here's what struck me about the financial piece that we offer here. There is a bunch of different pieces that they all work together to achieve the desired effect. And this was interesting on how learning like actually happens. Like, what do you need to learn? So I'm, I'm going to put a few of them up here and then you can see I'm going to back into discipleship with this. You, you can see where I'm going. Number one, there was a decision. There's intention. Do you intend to do something about your finances? Did you sign up for the course? Like you have to turn up. There's the first thing. There was actually preaching. He actually preaches on the video about this stuff. And what's that designed to do? To get you inspired and motivated. But like, that's not like enough there. That's often where church stops, by the way. Like we turn up and then we hear the preaching and then that's the end. If, if you haven't got some things working, there might be some other pieces here that you need. Um, I thought the testimonies were powerful there. That's a different thing than preaching and teaching. You see someone else, what happened to them? And you think this, they had a biker there who paid off, you know, 90 credit cards or something. You're like, Jesus, this guy can do it. I can. I can do that. At our men's retreat, guys gave their testimonies. It was powerful. I was teaching at that, but other guys were giving their testimony. I watched when someone starts telling their story and people lean in on those things. Knowledge. There is knowledge. Knowledge, like on the, in the financial course, you need to get on the right side of compound interest to understand how credit cards, you know, sneak up on you and that kind of stuff. He had a system or a way, like do this first, get the emergency fund first, you know, pay off your smallest debt. He had... He had a system that you could do. There was small group stuff. So now we're going to break out at our table. We're going to have a discussion. There was one-on-one -on -one discussions. Now stand, uh, turn with your spouse and do this exercise. Was it, find out who's the nerd and who's the free spirit. <laughs> who likes to make spreadsheets and who likes to spend. <laughs> you had to kind of like work that out. Uh, there was homework and accountability. There's an interesting piece of actually sending you out to do something specific and then circling back the next week to see if you did it. Okay, everyone, you got to make a budget this week, okay? A spending plan, okay. And, and I'm going to ask you next week if you did it. You go away and do that. You come back and, okay, who, had, who was able to do their budget? Uh, there was, and then it came down to your personal daily life. Like it was really every, you're making a spend decision. Should I make my lunch or should I buy that extra big Chipotle burrito again? <laughs> There's a leader, coach, mentor in the room. So we had this guy, Dennis Horcher, who teaches a course. He's very knowledgeable about this stuff. So, like, you can ask a question, and he'll know what to do. And even if you've got some complications, he'll actually privately wade into your stuff and help you figure that out. And then there's social support. We're all doing it together. It can be a little bit embarrassing. I don't know, like, you figure out, why well, I'm shy. I've got to redo my finances. It's so normal. And now we're all encouraging each other because we're all in this together. Practice. 
to learn something. This course, like 12 weeks, why was that interesting? Three months. Well, why does that help? Like doing the budget and just doing one month, like you got to get a rhythm. You got to habit forming right? It's interesting that they did this thing 12 weeks. And of course, they actually had an accommodation for relapse and restoration. You get off, but something will happen. You'll get knocked off your plan. You need a way to get back on. When you sign up for that course, it's actually lifetime. So you can come back again and get that started again. That's happened to us. So we had our plan going and then I got this giant tax bill from on the Canadian side. Because Canada, I think is communist now. Like I'm not sure <laughs> what's going on there, but I lost all the reserves and, and uh, knocked out the budget. So what, do you, the point is not to stay perfectly on the tightrope the whole time. The point is if you get fall off, you have a way to get back on. Relapse and restoration. Okay. I'm like amazed at this. Where did Dave Ramsey get all this stuff? This is genius. It's not just preaching. There's a lot more going on. Where do you get all this stuff? I'm pretty sure he got it from where? Jesus and the Bible, right? I see all these same pieces in play and more as Jesus... Our great teacher tries to impart life in the kingdom to his students. There's decision. They keep, follow me. Like there's an actual decision and intention. You can sometimes make the decision but not intend to really do the stuff. That can happen in lots of our crusades. Like you can have a, make a decision but not, you don't intend to do that stuff. Uh, there's preaching and teaching. That's what we're doing here today. There's testimony and stories. That's a powerful tool, hearing someone else's story. Um, there is knowledge. You know, Jesus knows. Have you ever thought that Jesus is the most knowledgeable person ever? Matthew 13, 12. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. He gives us the knowledge. He had a kind of a system, a way, like the same thing. He was the system. He was the way, like here I am. Um, there were small groups. Did you notice Jesus spends most of his time in a small group? He starts out with a big group and then he prays all night and he gets a small group of disciples. That's who he spends most time with in the small group. Um, there was homework and accountability. We don't think about that, but like he actually gets the disciples to start trying the stuff. It was important as he's teaching them to get them to try it. I love that moment in the feeding of the 5,000 where they're like, hey Jesus, you should probably uh, do something here. And he says to them, you feed them. What? Yeah, you feed them. The fully trained student becomes like the master. You got to start doing the stuff. You think different when you have to do it. Does anyone, I think this is why he left because if you have Jesus in the room, wouldn't you let him do everything? Uh, Jesus, why don't you go ahead? No, because to learn it, we have to start doing the stuff. Um, I love when he sends out, he gives homework. He sends out the 72. Do you remember this? The sending of the 72. Missionaries, and they, and they start preaching the gospel and casting out demons and doing all this stuff. Uh, he lets them try it. And then they circle back and he asks them, how's it go? How, how did it go? Remember he says that thing, I saw Satan fall from heaven. Like he, he, he actually coaches them and brings them back. Um, you'll see the one-on-one, -on -one, the having a buddy happening. You, you notice that Jesus also, he's a little bit closer like with Peter, like they have, there's one-on-one -on -one discussions that happen together. When he sends out the 72, uh, Jesus, like do you notice he sends them out in pairs? That's interesting. Why do you do that? You need, you need a friend. You need a buddy. We need the buddy system. Have each other's back. Even Jesus needs a friend. He, in John 15 at the end, that was kind of interesting when he says, uh, I no longer call you slaves in John 15 because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you're my friends. Something shifts there. And then we get this view in the Gospels too of Jesus' everyday personal life, like how he's making these decisions and these encounters, what everyday life looks like in the kingdom. That's why... God became human and made his home among us so that we can see what that looks like. Jesus was a leader and a coach and a mentor. You know, he's coaching these guys. He's leading these guys. Um, he arranged for social support. The church is formed. In act two, we're going to make a community so people can start looking after each other on that. We get a view on Jesus' personal spiritual practices. Brad's going to talk more about this. We're gonna, I think we're going to have a whole sermon maybe on, a whole message on personal practices and as an intentional force that can transform your life. But we see this a lot, like in Mark 1.35, before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Solitude, silence, prayer. Now, I don't know if he had to do that to stay in communion with his father, but I think we got a record of him praying like 25 times in the Gospels. I got a feeling like he's trying to demonstrate something for us. 
as a way to live. That's part of it. And of course, relapse and restoration. The big end of the gospel story where Peter's betrayed him. His number one guy, right, in John 18. And then that amazing reconciliation in John 21 where Peter's feeling so guilty, he's gone back to fishing and then Jesus turns up on the beach. Jumps in the water and swims, I'm sorry. Such a Canadian thing to say, beautiful moment. Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) I'm pretty sure in the Bible it says sorry, but sorry. Okay, what does this mean for us here and now as we invite the Holy Spirit to transform our lives? Okay, here's here's the application, okay? I need to get through this quick. Uh, To truly get this working in your life, we can't just like get the first two things or one or two of these things, like turning up and just listening to preaching. My preaching's not that good. It's not that, Brad's is maybe, but not mine. It's, it's like listening to Dave Ramsey on the radio only. That's not gonna do it, okay? Uh, so here's my thing for you. You might be missing a vital piece or two from this whole equation. My prayer for you today is that you might get those one or two missing pieces that you need to progress. Is it the decision, the intention? Have you actually made the decision? You can get actually pretty far in your church attendance without actually making a decision. If you have made that decision, I would love to talk with you. I will will hook you up. Preaching and teaching, do you need to, you're obviously turned up at church, you're you're preaching, hearing preaching and teaching. Are you teachable? Hmm. Testimony, do you need to hear someone else's story? Like, do you listen to people's stories and so you can identify with that and be inspired with that? Do you need some knowledge? Is there some piece of knowledge that you're missing? Like, maybe you need to be in the word more? Like, I don't know. What do you need? What is maybe, let me ask it this way, what's Jesus inviting you to maybe right now of these things on screen behind me? Do you need, do you need a bit more of a system of a way? Get yourself into something? a discipleship plan. Jesus is the way, like he's the whole way, but sometimes getting yourself in a little program. Um, Debbie Griggs told me about the big 10 that she uses to disciple her leaders at Young Life. A little bit of a system. Like we're gonna do some specific things, not just anything. Um, Small group, do you have, are you in a life group? I'm actually in charge of that. I will hook you up for that too. Do you have a place where you can have the discussion? Because you can't just hear, you gotta like have the discussion about this. Um, homework accountability. Do you need something to actually try it? And then circle back and see how that went? I actually think the accountability place is going to be the life group groups. We're starting to put, as we send out the life group messages, a little like homework assignment. Try this this week. Love your enemies like in this way. Come back and see how did that go. A friend. Do you have a spiritual friend? Like a, someone you can have a one-on-one discussion with. I, I have some spiritual friends. Like I actually, every, I aim for every Friday with my buddy from seminary that we can talk about everything. We have to Skype it because he's, he's back in Canada. But like we can have a one-on-one discussion. That is different than a group discussion. Would you, would you like a spiritual friend? I wonder if Jesus would give you that. What about just your everyday life? Like do you need to engage with the Holy Spirit in your personal everyday life? Do you need a leader or a coach or a mentor? Do you find some longing for that? Maybe God would give you that. Do you need some social support? Maybe like even get more involved at church and get around some people who are doing the same kind of thing so that we're doing it together. You ever been that one lone Christian trying to do it at work? You know, trying to live like this? Easier when we're doing it together. Maybe you just need some practice. Some spiritual practices. This is not meant to be a guilt thing, by the way, like how's your prayer life? But like, what would it be like for you to get invited into a deep, rich, and abiding prayer life conversation with Jesus? What might that do in your life for transformation? And of course, relapse and restoration. Maybe you need that. I don't know. Have you lost the plot? It's, it can happen. I really I enjoyed talking with some of the guys in the addiction and the recovery stuff. Relapse and restoration is part of the journey. Don't think it's never going to happen. It's going to happen. We're going to give you a way to get back up on the horse. That's the key. The key is not to never fall off the horse. The key is have a good way to get back up on it. I propose to you today, same with the kingdom. That's why God gave us confession and repentance. Get you back up on that. If you have lost the plot, 
on your Christian life, that's okay. I would love to talk with you out in the plaza. I will hook you up for that too. Let's get you back on the track. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Our lives don't transform just by being a fan of Jesus and listening to some preaching. Jesus' invitation is for us to follow him, to enter into all of life with him. The only question is whether we will really do it. Let me close with this. Uh, I was in my friend's church in North Carolina, my buddy who was the pastor, and he said something very profound in the service. Profound because it wasn't true. He wanted it to be true, but it wasn't true. Here's what he said. He was preaching just like this, and then he exclaimed over the service, he said, this is not a cooking show. This is a cooking school. I knew what he was getting at. We're supposed to be actually doing what Jesus taught, not just spectators. And as I sat there, I realized, nope, this is definitely a cooking show. How do I know that? Because we're all sitting in rows watching a guy on stage with a spotlight on him. Kind of like what we're doing right now. And that's not bad. That's part of it, actually. In fact, it might not have been a cooking show. It might have been a cooking lecture because he was not actually even demonstrating the thing that he was talking about. In a cooking school, here's how you know if you're in cooking school or discipleship school. Here's how you know you're in cooking school. You have your own station with some pots and pans and you actually chop onions and cook something while the chef comes around, watches you, coaches you, corrects you, and shapes you so that you can do what he or she does so that you become what he or she is, a master chef. Brothers and sisters, let's not make church into a cooking show. Let's actually have a cooking school of the kingdom. Let's actually learn to do this. Actually learn to cook up something healthy and nutritious and delicious and joyful in our lives so we can together feast and feed each other's souls with all our diverse and unique contributions and celebrate all that God is doing in and through us and share it with our neighbors. Are you willing to get schooled by Jesus? It's the best kind of school not what happened to you before. This is real learning, real life, life changing. He's inviting us. And I feel like he's just wondering if we're going to actually enroll for real. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the master. You are our great teacher. We're so thankful that you teach us I'm astounded that you gave your life for us on a cross and opened the kingdom, but I'm also astounded that you took the time, years, to come and teach, to teach us in all these ways. And I thank you that you're here in spirit still as our teacher. Lord, we don't want to just be hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. Show us our missing pieces what we need to get in place so that you can bring us into that life, so that we can bring, you can bring us into our life, so that the students will be fully trained and become like the teacher. Make us like you. Show us the way. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.